Hi everyone, just as a quick PSA before we get into the lecture, I it has been made no, known to me that um, I should have suggested that you guys edit the handout as you go along the like with the lecture. So um, if you want to print them out or you know edit them in your own time whilst watching the lecture, that's probably best for it because the lecture uh, the handouts are mainly like a skeleton outline, so it will have some bits that you can fill in if you want to just to make sure that you understand the content so yeah hi everyone and welcome to the second week of an introduction to paleontology with the safe cultural heritage group as always i'm jenna your mentor and today we'll be learning about the cambrian explosion which is a pivotal event in earth's history in this lecture you will learn about what it was key dates paleogeography and paleoclimate key fauna key localities and triggers and causes of these this explosion so what is the Cambrian explosion? It is the sudden appearance in the fossilized in a fossil record of complex animals with mineralized skeletal remains, as well as the emergence of more complex trace fossils. It's the also the emergence of major animal body plans, which we still see today. It is also the first appearance of large complex animals, as you can see in the image to your right. There's also an increase in ecosystem complexity. It's an idea that Charles Darwin considered when he was writing The Origin of Species. However, he wasn't alive to see when the Cambrian explosion got um, founded. So when the first fossils from that time period came out, he was the one that suggested that there probably was something back then, but we just weren't able to find any rocks of that age yet. Um, this just bearing in mind, this was not the beginning of multicellular life. Um, I just think as well that I need to talk to you and also explain that there are a group of researchers um, that believe that the Cambrian explosion wasn't just an explosion. It was a series of pulsated um, evolutionary events. Um, so yeah, there's just two thought processes behind how it happened. So key dates. It's early Cambrian to middle Cambrian um, at approximately 538.6 million years ago. The date of the Cambrian Ediacaran boundary keeps getting moved around so this date was kind of the most recent and also um, the one that's more generally accepted now. So the uh, overall Cambrian explosion lasted for around 20 million years. This, uh, the Cambrian follows on from the Ediacaran period, which was in the Precambrian, uh, around 635 to 541 million years ago. So the Ediacaran, peri peri uh, Ediacaran period is most famous for the Ediacaran biota, which is the oldest defined multicellular organisms. Uh, they are like worm-like, disc-like, just beast like organisms that we don't really know how to describe them really. And within the Ediacaran fossils, there have been no hard parts that have been found. And um, their relationship within, if they are actually animals, is quite heavily debated, as well as their relationships with organisms in the Cambrian. So um, here's quite a useful geological time scale that we um, that shows both the Cambrian and Ediacaran periods. So um, you can see here that the first Ediacara biota members appeared around 575 million years ago. And then the sort of first trilobites occurred uh, 525 as well, million years ago, as well as the Burgess Shale, which was middle Cambrian aged and around 506 million years ago. And the Burgess Shale is quite an important locality that we will be discussing in this lecture. So paleogeography and climate. So during the uh, during the Cambrian, there was a supercontinent known as Pinotia, which began to break up due to the Iapetus Ocean forming. So the supercontinent was um, breaking up, this ocean was forming in between um, continents known as Laurentia, Siberia, Baltica and Gondwana. Um, so yeah, and then um, the overall paleoclimate was cool and quite cold with a gradual warming event towards the end of the Cambrian. 
uh, in Gondwana, um, yeah, Gondwana co covered the South Pole, which um, changed the way in which polar currents moved around, which brings nutrients to different areas and a whole load of different effects that the polar co currents have. So we are now going on to the Burgess Shale. So the Burgess Shale is a really famous locality in um, Cam for the Cambrian explosion. It's really well known. Um, every paleontologist has heard about the Burgess Shale and has learned about it at some point. So where is it? It's in the Yoho National Valley in the Canadian Rocky Mountains in British Columbia, Canada. So it was uh, discovered in 1909 by Charles Doolittle Walcott, who was a American paleontologist and geologist as well as an administrator for the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, and there's two tales of how Walcott found the fossils. So the first one was that his wife's horse slipped, um, which overturned a rock that Walcott then hit with a hammer, split in half, and found some really nice, well-preserved specimens. And then the second tale is, as he was walking down the side of a, the mountain, he stopped, looked down to try and find his footing, and there was a fossil in the foot, the rock by his foot. Um, the age of the Burgess Shale is Middle Cambrian, 505 to 510 million years old, and the primary geology is shale, which is a really, really good rock for preservation of fossils. So scientists alone have excavated over 65,000 different specimens from Walcott Quarry alone. There are three different quarries within that one area and the Walcott Quarry was the first one found, well, excavated. The Burgess Shale is really famous. It's a lager stater. Uh, it's most famous for its exceptional preservation of soft bodied animals, which you will be seeing later on in this course. Well, lecture really, yeah. Um, so the main Burgess Shale sites in this area is the Walcott Quarry, the Raymond Quarry and the Collins Quarry. The Walcott Quarry was the most famous is the most famous really, and it was the first discovered um, Burgess Shale locality. And here's a image of Charles Walcott excavating in Walcott Quarry around 1913. So the paleo environment of the Burgess Shale was one of a deep basin that was surrounded by cliffs. So the creatures were thought to have lived in deeper waters within the basin, and they probably were more likely to live at the base of this um, submarine cliff known as Cathedral Escarpment. Um, and the shape of the escarpment would have allowed for mud flows and other sediment flows to sort of channel in at the base of this escarpment. And the deposits would then have enveloped and really exceptionally well preserved the organisms that lived there. So how did the Burgess Shale form? It's really similar to what we discussed last week with how organisms, um, how organisms got preserved last week. So uh, organisms living at the bottom of the platform, uh, the mud in the sediment gets rapidly, well, sediment, which would have been mud, rapidly gets deposited, covering the organisms. And then additional layers of sediment would get deposited, flat, uh, compressing the organisms, as well as compressing the mud surrounding them to form mudstones. Over time, mudstones then get, um, when they get compressed, often form, sh form shale. And then gradually the sediment layers come up to the surface via erosion, exposing the fossiliferous rocks. Uh, so the fauna of the Burgess Shale. So there are 150 species of animals, algae and bacteria that have been described to date. Um, in this diagram, it should be kind of noted, this is a really interesting diagram to me, where um, it highlights the amount of organisms that we wouldn't have had or known about without the exceptional soft part preservation. So the top one is the Burgess Shale community from Walcott Quarry, with the soft part preservation and the bottom one is the one that would have been only found if we used hard part preservation. Um, so we will be going through some really interesting and also some quite weird species that have been found in Burgess Shale, um, just kind of highlighting key ones. So the first one is Anomalocaris canadiensis um, and it measured around 30 centimetres in length, which makes it the, it's the largest kind of thing that was going around at that time. Uh, and it had large eyes, which were on stalks, 
grasping limbs, swimming lobes, and tooth-like mouthparts. So this fossil was often found isolated. So it was um, like body parts were found separated and um, they were described as other organisms. So for example, like a key one would have been these, um, like the front appendages up there on the head. The was They were first thought to be shrimp. However, when um, a anomalocarid fossil was getting prepped during the 1980s, they found that these shrimp then attached to a larger head. And then that head was also attached to a large body. And um, another example would be the mouth part. Um, they thought that it was a jellyfish fossil. However, it was the mouth part. Um, and so, the um, the skeleton, well, the body, was a non-mineralized exoskeleton, meaning that full body preservation, such as the one that you see on this slide, is really rare. The eyes were on stalks and were large. So this, as well as the appendages and the um, large mouth, which was also spiny, would have suggested that this was a predator. So the second one, the second weird fossil is Hallucigenia sparsa. This um, was, this is a lobopodian worm. We have recently only just come to that conclusion. And um, it was originally, it's measured around 0.5 to 5.5 centimeters in length, as well as thought to be a scavenger. So it was originally described to have walked on these spines um, with the tentacles were the tentacles above these spines would have been a feeding apparatus. However, it was found that we had interpreted it upside down and um, these um, tentacles were actually a row of legs. So the spines were not legs at all and the little tentacles at the bottom were. Um, just, they're weird animals and I love them. Uh, the third fossil example would be Morella splendens, splendens, and this is the most common fossil animal found in the Burgess Shale. It measured around two centimetres or less. Uh, it was the first fossil collected by Walcott, and the its phylogenetic af affinity is that it's currently accepted to be a stem group arthropod. Um, so Walcott informally called Morella a lace crab. Uh, which is still sometimes thrown around, but it's more or less not accepted generally in phylogeny. And there have been over 25,000 specimens collected of this um, organism. And that was around 2006 that number came from. So then there's probably been a many, many more since then. Um, there has been evidence of in the fossil record of Morella molting, which is really cool. That's um, when arthropods shed their um, skeleton, well, exoskeleton. And it was thought, it's thought to be a benthic, which is a bottom dwelling organism, scavenger. Uh, Wewaxia is, um, is a bilet bilaterally symmetrical organism. Um, it's measured around five centimeters in length and it is, its whole body, apart from its underside, is covered in an array of scale-like elements, which are known as sclerites. Um, and Wawaxia's phylogeny is really heavily debated, so it's not really, we don't really know where it is. And its feeding apparatus, which is on the um, ventral side, which is the one without the plates, uh, is similar to that of a soft-bodied organism known as Odontogryphus, which is also from the Burgess Shale. And it's thought that Wewaxia would have eaten like cyanobacterial mats that grew on the sea floor, like Odontogryphus. Uh, Opabenia, this is one of my favorite Cambrian organisms. It's a anomalocarid and it has five eyes, a proboscis, a proboscis which is four times longer than the head, and a backwards facing mouth. Uh, it measures around seven centimeters in length and it is really rare within the bird of shale. So this proboscis is thought to have grasped food and then put it into its mouth. 
So it's really cool. It's a really cool animal. And then finally, we have Pikea grasslands. And this is thought to be a one of the earliest chordates, which has a back, which is an animal that has a backbone. So um, a chordate includes mammals, reptiles, fish, birds, as well as sea squirts and lamplets. Uh, it measured around 5.5 centimeters in length. Oh, sorry, yeah. The Pikea also has a notochord and that's why um, it's thought that it's a chordate. Um, it also has a really well-defined head with antenna-like tentacles. And um, there are around 100 myomeres, which are muscle segments along the body. And it allows for movements such as swimming side to side. So the notochord is like the primitive start of a backbone. Um, in humans, it forms during pregnancy and then it turns into the vertebral column. Notochords um, such as Pikea um, have been found in several basal chordates from the Cambrian, such as Hykoichthys, which is from the Shenzhen Formation in China. Um, it, the notochord is made out of tissues similar to the cartilage which surrounds the nervous system in us today, and it lies along the head-to-tail axis of organisms. Uh, so the lo main locations of the Burgess Shale type deposits, there are around 40 uh, localities worldwide which exhibit Burgess Shale type preservation from the Cambrian. And um, these are some key examples. We've got Sirius Passus in Greenland, uh, the Wheeler and Margin formations in Utah, uh, the Shenzhang and Emu Bay in Australia. Shenzhang is really cool as it is an early deposit than the Burgess Shale. Um, and we find loads of different cool little animals and all, well, organisms really. Um, so the triggers and causes of the Cambrian explosion. There are proposed to have been three different categories of the triggers. So environmental, ecological and evolutionary. So the first environmental trigger was um, would be oxygenation. And it was kind of proposed that this would be the cause of the Cambrian explosion. explosion. Um, however, there's a lack of precise values of oxygen levels um, before and after and before, during and after the uh, Cambrian explosion. Um, you'd also expect to see some variation in oxygen levels at the Ediacaran and Cambrian boundary. However, there isn't any like definite, um, like defined variation. Um, and a, another sort of um, key thing about the oxygenation theory is that the iron content in Cambrian aged rocks suggest that the shallow waters were extremely well oxygenated. Uh, a second environmental um, cause would be glaciation. So um, some researchers suggested that the entire earth was covered in ice before the Cambrian explosion. This is known as a snow is snowball earth. Um, snowball earth, however, ended at 635 million years ago about 100 million years before the Cambrian explosion. So um, the main explanation for glaciation would be that the, as the ice covered um, quite a lot of area, uh, niches would have been limited for life in the sea, uh, as it would have blocked sunlight, which would have allowed for like microbial mats and cyanobacterial mats to grow and algae to grow. Um, so once the ice had kind of and the glacier, glaciers had melted, more environments, more niches became available for organisms to exploit. And the third em environmental trigger would be nutrient influx. So um, there were three major mountain building events occurring during the Cambrian, which was the East African origine, which is the term for mountain building, the Brazilian Brazilina and Damara originally, and the Kungan origin, uh, all of which took place during this time. And um, the formations of supercontinents would have occurred roughly around the same time as the Cambrian explosion. The Iatus Ocean also opened up, as we talked about in previous slides. And um, so these formations of the continents and oceans, as well as like mountainous regions, 
would have allowed for an increase in the primary production of nutrients. And um, these events would have led to nutrients such as phosphorus and nitro nitrogen to enter the sea. Um, however, the increase in nutrients was probably not linked to the increase of biodiversity, which is the number of species, or an increase in disparity, which is the number of phyla within the Cambrian. So we, yeah. Um, and here's an example. So this is the late Cambrian. So we see that Gondwana has formed Laurentia, Siberia and Baltica with the Iaptis Ocean in between. So Laurentia would have been sort of where the Burgess Shale would have occurred. So ecological explanations would have been, um, for example, it may have been a result of coevolution, with some organisms being forced to evolve by changes within the ecosystem. So um, the example given here, predators evolve, e.g. anomalous carid, so therefore skeletons evolve for protection, or and body plants adapted for for swimming also evolves, which means that they can escape from the predators. Um, and also, alongside this, previously unexploited niches and environments could now be lived in due to um, the continents being built, as well as well the basins around the continents forming, as well as um, the ice melting, which would have allowed for more environments, which would therefore have allowed for adaptations of organisms suited for those environments to evolve. As well as this, so another ecological fact that we need to take into consideration is the existence of ecosystem engineers. So um, these are this is the modification of an abiotic environment by a species that creates, modifies or destroys the niches of other species. So an example of which today would have been a coral reef. Um, and back in the Cambrian would have been an archaeocyapid reef. So a few examples of archaeocyapids are circled in red here. So um, the final like category of the triggers is evolutionary um, causes. So uh, during the Cambrian we have the development of the animal body plan which is controlled by genoregulatory networks known as GRNs. Um, and the most famous or common example of this is the homeobox gene, which are also known as POX genes. These are kind of like the master control genes and one mutation of a HOX gene in an ancestral organism could have potentially caused a massive morphological change in the descendant. So um, an example of this are eyes. So um, the a key example is Cinderella mucala, which is a non-trilobite arthropod from the Shenzhen Formation in China. Um, so in, um, in Shenzhen, there are several other taxas in this formation which also have eyes. Um, and they are, there are lots of different vision systems, so different ways in which eyes were used. Um, and it has the evidence of the earliest eyes in the Metazoan family uh, fossil record and Cinderella specimens are usually 5 to 13 centimeters long and in each eye there are over 2,000 omatidae, sorry that's really hard to say, omatidia, which are single units of the compound eye in arthropods so um, they had two, over 2,000 of these in each eye so Cinderella is the oldest my, has the oldest microanatomical evidence of highly developed vision in the early Cambrian, which is really important to have, and it's really really well preserved. So if you can see on the image in A, you can it, you can see perfectly clear where the eyes are. And so the kind of main take home from all the triggers and causes is that it's possible that the Cambrian explosion was triggered by numerous interrelated causes. So um, shown in this flow diagram here. So it could be that the evolutionary, ecological and um, environmental as uh, standalone hypothesis could have all acted in one big, like could have all occurred all at the same time, which would have lent to the Cambrian explosion being a thing. So here are some further readings. So um, I've included this week some really cool um, 
videos. So um, PBS Eons do a lot of great videos in terms of um, paleo and just explaining it, um, as well as PaleoCast podcasts. So PaleoCast is a group of paleontologists and they do a podcast on certain aspects of paleontology. They also um, get um, researchers to come onto the show and talk about what they do in their work, as well as um, sometimes going to conferences and recording talks from the conferences. Um, also find as well at the bottom right, there are two books that if you want to get, you can get them. They're really interesting. So um, The Cambrian Explosion, The Construct of Animal Biodiversity by Owen and Valentine. I have a copy here and um, is a really useful book. And then The Crucible of Creation, The Burgess Shale and the Rise of Animals by Simon Conway Morris is like the Bible of all things Cambrian Explosion and the Burgess Shale. Um, which is so if you're a Cambrian enthusiast, definitely get that one. Uh, so here are the references, and here are the image references. As always, I am contactable here. Um, I will be able to check the Google Classroom a bit more due to work commitments allowing me to have that time. Uh, so yeah, I look forward to speaking to you this week as well as seeing you all next week. So bye, guys.